Um, as Mario said, I'm David Perez. I'm the founder and CEO of Seamless Medical Systems. But before I get started, I want to pick up on what Mario was saying about the ecosystem. I was an entrepreneur in New York for 15 years in, in, in New York City. Moved here about three years ago with my family. And um, just dove right into the whole entrepreneurial community here. And it's true what you said about kind of being the smaller community and it's just kind of nascent and growing. And you know, being a big fish in a small pond makes a big difference. And all of us are in a smaller pond and we can make the ripples happen a lot quicker. And um, you know, the company that I'll tell you about today, I could, I could have started in Silicon Valley in Boston or New York. And it would have cost me four times as much to, f to get the company started and it would have been intensely competitive to get people to work for me. And um, it would have been really hard to get noticed. So um, with that, I'm, I'm very excited about the entrepreneurial community. I'm committed to helping you know, it grow and be a mentor and, and, and try to be an example of what can actually be done here. Um, and I'll talk a little bit, bit more about that in a second. So how many are existing entrepreneurs in the audience tonight? Okay, how many are wannabes? Have some ideas. All right, get that hand up higher. Come on. All right, good. So I'll tell you my story. Um, I think I was born an entrepreneur, and I really didn't realize that until, retro until after I got older and until my eight-year-old son, when he was probably, he's nine now, and when he was six, and he was just negotiating with me about money, about jobs, about dad used to sell this, or why do I buy that? And I said, yep, look it in a mirror. You know, and he has just got it in his blood. And so I don't have any worry about Sebastian. He'll never get a job. He'll always create his own opportunity. I don't ever see it. And I'm unemployable myself. So, um, you know, I, it, it took me till I was about 40 to go out and really get my, start my first business. And I was just sick and tired of working for the man and looking for inspiration. And I found it in a dinner with a client. I was, I've been in interactive multimedia, we used to call, that, call it that, digital marketing for 25, or, yeah, 25 years. And I was sitting with a client, it was Colgate Palmolive. I was working for some other company. And the guy said, a guy like you should start a Hispanic marketing company. And I said, really, why? I said, what's a Hispanic marketing company? He said, you know, a Spanish language advertising company. I didn't say, I didn't know what that was. He said, you know, you're, you're, you're a smart guy. There's, there's, you know, the industry's not that well evolved and, and um, we need good people in the business. And so um, the light bulb went off and I said, yeah, I could do a interactive Hispanic agency. So I did research that night and I noticed there was not one to be found. This was June of 99. There were 20 Hispanic advertising agencies. One had a website, three had email addresses. So I said, hmm, there's an opportunity. I know anything there is to know about interactive marketing and building a website. I've been doing it as long as everybody has. I don't know a damn thing about Hispanic marketing. Eh, I'll figure it out. Soy Latino. So I got a laptop, quit my job, well, first I said to my wife, who was eight months pregnant with our daughter, do you think I should quit my job and start a company? <laughs> and God bless her. She thought about it. I had a business plan. She said, yeah, what's the worst case that can happen? You get called by headhunters every week. You go out and get another job. I said, yes, dear. In my mind, I said, there's no way I'm going to go get another job. So I gave myself six months, you know, a chunk of dough. And um, I had done some research. And I started with a laptop, started going, and um, got my first client, which was Chase Manhattan Bank, to do a uh, Hispanic advertising campaign, which was pretty good. And I met this other fellow, and he said, I want to start a Hispanic incubator. Now, he was from the newspaper world. He didn't know a damn thing about the internet. I knew about the internet. So together, and this was the fall of 99, and timing, one thing about being an entrepreneur, timing is everything, good or bad. So at that moment, the timing was good to start a company and raise money in the dot-com space. So we, start, we created an internet incubator. I had the, 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 um, multi, the um, internet experience. He had raised money before. And on December 23rd, we checked the Chase ATM machine on Broadway and said $13,872. $13,872,000 in it. We looked at each other and said, shit, what do we do now? We've been working out of Starbucks. We had a 15-slide PowerPoint deck. Great time to raise money. If you, those of you with any historical context, remember that in April of 2000, the NASDAQ crashed, dot-coms went bust, and the world started to unravel. And so macro timing was great for a moment, and then it shifted to be absolutely awful a few months later. So we struggled, 
And then when we saw the towers collapse, the World Trade Towers collapse on September 11th, that was a tough time. So that business eventually, well, before that, I should back up, we got to a total of $20 million raised, 125 employees, offices in Manhattan, Sao Paulo, Buenos Aires, and Los Angeles. And then we just had a really tough go of it and basically wrapped the company up in 2004. Out of the ashes of that, I created a company called Latin Force, which was more of an extension of, of the um, Hispanic advertising business, internet advertising. And we had great clients. We had Kraft Foods for seven years, um, Wells Fargo, Nike, the NFL. Those guys were tough, I'll tell you. Um, MTV, Nickelodeon, ING, world-class brands. And um, in 2007, I decided I wanted to grow the business. I had been in the space for 10 years. I kind of knew all the players in the Hispanic marketing arena and said, you know, there's no leader in the space. Again, looking at opportunity. There's only all these little entrepreneurial-owned companies, yet there's no one big company. And what if I was able to pull together advertising agencies, a research firm, a, a digital firm, a data business? We would create a real powerhouse. So I went out and spoke to some funding firms. And this one small shop called Goldman Sachs said they wanted to back me. And it was before they were called the blood-sucking vampire. They were the blood-sucking vampire, but they just hadn't been called that yet. But, true, but honestly, the couple of people I dealt with there were really great folks. And they financed this strategy that I had and made the first acquisition on June the 1st, 2007. $20 million acquisition of a data business, and I combined my business with them. Again, macro timing. That was when, if you remember, the subprime market was starting to shake. Bear Stearns was having trouble because of subprime business. The market was starting to unravel. And I just hung my head. We had signed the deal. I had signed you know, literally a row of papers this long, documents on a lawyer's desk. I should have been happy. But I looked and said, oh, shit, it's happening again. This is going to be bad. The econ something, this ba economy is going to turn bad. I didn't know how bad it was going to be. But I knew enough to sell all the stock I owned in July of 07 and I've been in cash ever since, um, which I'm really happy about because it helped fund this next business. Anyway, so that long story short, the um, 2009 rolls around, we're struggling, a marketing company in a recession, marketing budgets get cut, Lehman goes bust, that was a scary time, it really was. So we struggled along, Goldman Sachs put their checkbook away, no more acquisitions, and um, just personally, I had lost my, I was living in New York with my family. I grew up in New Jersey. My mom had passed away. And one day driving into Manhattan just occurred to me. I said, you know what? It's time to leave. It's time to get out of here. My wife and I have been talking about moving. And pretty, you know, I called her on the phone. I said, Nicole, it's time to move. We were leaving New York. There was a very long pause at the end of the phone. She said, really? When? I said, as soon as we possibly can. So August of 2009, we moved to Santa Fe. So I've been living in Santa Fe for about three years. And um, I sold my, my interest in, in that business, Latin Force. And, you know, there weren't enough zeros on it, on that check, to change my life. And it's all about the zeros. There was just enough for me to have a, enjoy the ski season. So I skied 45 days that year, and it was an unbelievable snow year. So I had a lot of fun. It was like being in college again. So then I really, I really was looking, well, what am I going to do next? Because what, what, I knew I'd have, I would start a business. I just had no clue what it would be. It was a little pressure, two young kids in private school, you know, supporting the family, sucking down savings at an astronomical rate on a monthly basis. And, um, but as I explored, I wanted to do something that was innovative, I wanted to do something that was progressive, I wanted to do something that was meaningful to a larger group of people that was just beyond me and my family. It was just beyond, you know, making a living for myself and my family and, and having, a, a, you know, employees. And I wanted to do something that, as Steve Jobs used to say, would put a dent in the universe. Again, no clue what that would be. So I started looking. I, I looked at opening a wine bar. Not a big dent on that one. Um, I looked at buying a fly fishing business. It was great. I would love that. Again, not a way to make a living. I became the CEO of a local tech company here in Albuquerque that was doing mobile, mobile application technology development. Um, that's another story. Um, and then I took a deep dive on alternative energy. And here in New Mexico, that was a great thing. But that, when I concluded, was one, I know absolutely nothing about the space, which has never really stopped me before. But um, two, it was hundreds of millions of dollars and decades before that anything was commercially 
viable in that business. It was billions of dollars of government support which wasn't coming. And that industry just gets whipsawed by the price of a barrel of oil. So I said, well, forget that. Then one day I was sitting in the doctor's office and um, going to, you know, got the clipboard and paper and I was filling out my name, the address, the phone number, my date of birth, the date, again and again and again and again and again, six times on six forms. I said, yeah, we all know that's right. We're all patients, right? It's frustrating as hell. And then you figure out, well, where's that going to go? And somebody's got to read my writing and type that into the, their computer system. So and then I looked around the room, and it was sort of a typical scene for a waiting room. There was Rachel Ray on the television with the volume shut off. There was a stack of brochures about you know, hemorrhoids and bunions and some gross skin disease. And then there was a pile of ratty magazines that had pages torn out you know, and just smudges of who knows what disgusting things on the covers. And, you know, one issue with Britney Spears with her hair, head shaved off, obviously a couple years old. And then it happened. I was staring into Britney's half-crazed eyes <laughs> when the burning light of inspiration hit me. And um, I looked down at the iPad in my lap. I looked at the clipboard. And I said, why aren't, the, why aren't these forms on the iPad? I can write on the iPad. I can write an email. I can write on the iPad. Why aren't the magazines? On the iPad. I have magazines on the iPad. Why aren't the brochures with those health conditions on this iPad? Geez, why isn't Rachel Ray in there too? And, and I said, okay, well, if that was the case, I'd have a lot better experience as a patient. I wouldn't have to type my name and address over and over again. The office would get more cleaner data, more accurate information. They wouldn't have to retype it in. We, there'd be, we'd save trees. There'd be a lot less waste and landfills. The practice would save a lot of money. They wouldn't have to pay for the paper, the printing, the scanning, um, the shredding. And, um, and it would be a better experience. Heck, I could even learn about why I'm at the doctor. Instead of kind of staring at Rachel Ray cooking some souffle, I could be reading about why I'm there for my asthma or whatever that may be. Those you know, brochures weren't very attractive. So. In that moment, I stood there with an iPad in one hand, the 21st century, the paper and clipboards in the other hand, the 19th century. And in that gap, I saw the opportunity of a lifetime. So I walked up to the front desk, I took the clipboard and gave her back the forms, and I said to the woman holding my iPad, wouldn't you rather have me fill out the information on this? And without missing a beat, she said, oh my God, when? And I knew I was onto something. So I rushed home, I went on the app store, I looked online, I spent about four hours. There were 20,000 medical apps at the time out of the 750,000 Apple apps that were on. Not one did what I thought about. Not one was a, had a registration form, an information form. It was all for doctors. So, okay, that's interesting. Found a local guy and, and worked with a local doctor to create a prototype of a review of systems. And that's the health history form that you pay, fill out when you go to the doctor's office. And um, it took a while to get that done, but super simple prototype, just proof of concept. Would this work? Doctor used it that night. He called me. He said, this is great. It'll pay for itself in a week. I'm buying two more iPads for my practice. I said, well, if it works for one doctor, it might work for more. I'm from a medical family. My father was a, a family doctor his whole life. He came from Bolivia in 1930, 1950. And uh, my brother's a practicing physician here at the university. He's a surgeon here. And, but most importantly, I'm a patient. We're all patients. We could all relate to this. So I did some more. I, I put that app on the App Store. And in eight weeks, I had 6,500 downloads in a dozen countries without any marketing, any promotion, any website, nothing. The first day, I sold 25 for six bucks on the 4th of July. People were looking for this. So that said to me, there's a huge opportunity. People were looking for it, and they were looking for it in Colombia, Mexico, Argentina, Japan, Korea, France, Germany. I was blown away. First thing I did every morning was open up the iTunes Connect and look and see how many downloads there were. So I said, now we have a business. I formed Seamless Medical Systems on October 19th, 2011. Today, we have Snap is the name of the product. It's an iPad-based patient registration health inf information platform. We have 12 full-time employees. We are installing Snap and in beta customers in, in Oregon, New Mexico, and in Florida. 
and the future looks really bright. Um, further research that I did on the market, as I started to put it together, these numbers blow me away, is there's 1.7 million healthcare providers in the United States. Those are degreed people that can see a patient and get paid for it, a doctor, a nurse, a dentist, a chiropractor, a um, physical therapist. They see four billion patient visits a year. Four billion. So what I've created is a media channel, the only digital media channel reaching a captive audience in medical waiting rooms. The only competition we have, frankly, is this. Not Rachel Ray, not the ratty old magazines, not the disgusting brochures. Because every patient sits in the waiting room with their iPad, with Snap, while they're waiting to see the doctor. And when they're in the exam room, the doctor can say, oh, here, you have high, high blood pressure. Read this information from the Mayo Clinic. So we have an enormous opportunity in front of us. Um, I funded the company with my own, my own resources. I've um, gotten some angel investors, friends and family, my brother, um, a number of other doctors in, in the community. I'm up in Santa Fe, most of our investors in Santa Fe. Uh, raised about 900,000 a day. I'm doing a $2 million round right now. I'm trying like hell to avoid the VCs. And we can talk about that later if you want. Um, I've done that dance. And um, so, you know, the mind of an entrepreneur is kind of an interesting, weird place. We have to be 100% confident in what we are doing and the pursuit of our endeavor. And yet, always question our path. Always question, what are we doing? Should we be doing something different? Learn. We have to be flexible to adapt to the changing environment because it is dramatically changing. Um, you know, I believe that entrepreneur, entrepreneurship is what this, it's what America is based on, and it is what will bring us out of this recession. There's, I don't, th you know, this is an extreme comment, but I don't think there's any more jobs to be had. There's no jobs. We need to graduate college and get, someone's gonna hire you to do what? With a $100,000 debt for an undergrad? How are you gonna pay that off? So. I even question the value of an undergraduate education. From a return on investment perspective, it's a real hard sell right now. So I think we all have to be creative and entrepreneurial in whatever we do. If you're a teacher, if you're a doctor, you have to be entrepreneurial. If you're a government worker, you have to be entrepreneurial. If you're, a, you know, you're, you're embarking on your, your career, you have to be entrepreneurial in whatever you do. And so any of you that are thinking about starting a company, creating a movement, starting a nonprofit, inventing a product, Pursue it. Pursue it with all the passion you have in your heart. Do your homework. Be clear-eyed about the challenges that you have to face. Be flexible to adapt to the changing environment. But most importantly, never lose confidence in your ability to pursue and in your dreams. Um, I'd like to close with um, a quote that my wife Nicole gave me 15 years ago as I was embarking on this path. And it's from Ralph Waldo Emerson. And um, now I'm going to forget it. Um, how's this quote go? Damn. Um, it goes something like this. Um, do, um, do not go down the path um, that you see in front of you. This is not exactly. Do not pursue the path alone. Choose and go instead where there is no path and leave a trail. Thank you very much. Thank you.